Yeah, I'm from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Okay, great. Uh, some of my best friends are uh, from Netherlands. Oh, cool. Are they also from crypto and blockchain uh, industry? Yes. Cool. Yes. Very cool. And that's live on YouTube. So now everyone knows we love the Netherlands. Okay, <laughs> uh, everyone. Big from Holland. Big, yeah, big, you know, big orange hello. Uh, everyone, welcome back to Crypto Wednesdays after a long hiatus, which was mostly mostly my fault. I'll even say it was 99% my fault. Um, just a lot of life changes, just a lot of geographical relocation. But I think this is, you know, we don't quite do it in a linear manner, but I think this is Crypto Wednesdays, what we're going to call episode 23, even though we do have like 22A and B and C and all that other stuff. Don't ask. We're, we're just playing jazz here. Um, as you know, or I think you, some of you know, uh, I'm, I'm Gordon Einstein. I'm an attorney who practices law in the crypto and blockchain areas. Uh, I would, before we get to our illustrious guest, I would like my illustrious co-host, Sander. Sander, can you introduce yourself if you would be so kind? Yeah, sure. And, and first of all, Gordon, I, I, I'm happy that we are here again. You know, this is the kickoff of the new year. A lot of exciting things are going on in the industry us doing the personal development and having great guests like Alex. So mm-hmm. Alex, on behalf of Gordon and myself, we're happy to have you on the show. Thank you for spending some time. And also everybody. We, we, Santa, hey, you look animated, hey, but I, th- I think you're muted all of a sudden. I'm so. here. So I want to start by saying, Gordon, I brought you a rose. This is Gordon's rose. Aww. This is uh, Sanders' rose. So I brought a rose oh. for each of you. Um, I found them. Um, with my girlfriend Taylor as we were walking by and the garbage. I brought, found a whole huge bouquet of them, so I've been giving them away. <laughs> but they're that still... Was, okay, that, that, started re- that started really high and then kind of dropped down a little bit. Um, well, here, Alex, let, let me introduce you before you kind of roll on but in they're there. from the Capitol building. They're from a government function. So they've been smelled by the governor of Puerto Rico. Ah. Okay, I'm, I'm glad this is a video show. Uh, everyone, please meet... My good friend and Sanders' new friend and everyone's new friend, Alex Leitman. I've known Alex, I think, four or five years now. Um, introduced through mutual friends. We kind of got you know connected one way or another. It was like, hey, guys, you guys should meet. Alex, I think the way we like really became friends was I was giving a presentation at a law firm on blockchain and crypto. I barely knew you. I invited you. In you Century told, City. Yes, good memory. You were kind enough to come. And I think we established like an intellectual type friendship at that point. And you're... You always struck me as a real polymath and real good guy, person who's done a, a lot of things, a lot of things with a lot of things. And, you know, published author, tons of white papers, tons of projects. It's, it's, hard to, it's hard to label you other than just, oh my God, it's Alex Lightman. So who knows where this conversation is going to go. But the way I like to start off each one of these shows is I always make an analogy to sort of the Marvel, you know, Wolverine origin story thing. I, I want to know the, the, the origin story of Alex. Okay, and you know, you got the matching beard to the Wolverine. All you need is like the hair up on the side. So t- tell us a little bit about Alex. Tell us your origin story. And, and, I, and I reserve the right to really interrupt because, you know, it's half my show. So go well, ahead. Well, when you say origin story, how far back do you want me to go? How many, how much? I, I don't, do I don't need to, to know anything about your parents and how they biologically formed you, but just your education, your, your career path. And also, how did you end up in blockchain and crypto? But just kind of, you know, g- give us a portrait of Alex as a younger man. Sure. Well, uh, my mother was an early hippie and I was born in Hollywood on the dining room table. I used to say the kitchen room table, but my mother said, how can you say that? That's disgusting is the dining room table. And there were, I guess, uh, 20 people present at the birth with lawn chairs around her. So and my mother worked at an early natural food store. That is to say that I was raised by somebody who is very eccentric and I am myself eccentric in many ways. And the, the home for people who are eccentrics who want to make money is the blockchain and crypto. So uh, I think that we have found our home and those people who could think for themselves, those people who could make their own mind up, bought Bitcoin when they first heard of it, they heard of it, they bought Ethereum. And now they, they can look back and all these people who are expressing conventional wisdom uh, we're not there. So I guess the origin story is just that I was taught from an early age to think for myself and to go after what I thought was good, regardless of what 99% of other people say, because the world is all and conventional wisdom looks dumb from the hindsight of the future. Remember, we used to bleed people with leeches. As far as my education, I went to MIT and I went to Harvard 
I made up my own major within civil and environmental engineering. I called enterprise engineering. It was all about how to create new industries. And so for me, just like some people, uh, you, you have truffle hunting pigs and mm -hmm. truffle hunting pigs will go look for, for truffles in the forest. Um, I like new industries. I like seeing the, the fresh green shoots, like uh, even a person with an idea that could become an industry. And so uh, the, there, I guess you could say there are two phases of my exploring that. One is looking at it and then writing about it. And that's called being a futurist. So mm -hmm. my first article, I published, I guess, about 300 articles, 35 of them on crypto. But the first one was the cover story of the Futurist magazine way back in June 1985. And wow. it was called Pixel Power, the Graphic Revolution in Computers. And in it, I basically said that in the future, we're going to be walking around with a handheld computer that has a language that's like uh, hieroglyphics, that will have a language mostly like pictures and so on. And if I look at that article today, I'm actually pretty proud. What was that? Um, 36, 36 years ago. Um, so 36 years ago, I basically predicted what we were what we're holding in our hands right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as uh, crypto, I had, I guess, a, a start, a false start, and then a real start. And the false start was when I bought Bitcoin back in 2011. And wow. I had a young guy in my building uh, in Santa Monica who was the only kid in the building. And I'd known this kid since he was five years old. His name is Luke. And he was in a Steven Spielberg TV show called Sheriff Fudge. So he was Sheriff Fudge in the story. And we were working out together and he wanted to go in with me. So we invested in Bitcoin at the same time. And a few other people did at the same time. And every mm -hmm. time that Bitcoin would go down, he would freak out. Oh, my God, Bitcoin's going down. And I got so sick of him worrying about Bitcoin. I said, sell your Bitcoin. I don't want to hear about it anymore. I'll sell mine. Oh, no. And I just left it alone until uh, my girlfriend, Taylor, got me to start painting. And I had this feeling like I really needed to make a painting for Brock Pierce. Mm -hmm. And so I made a painting for Brock and I asked him to pay me for it. And he said, I'm only going to pay you in Bitcoin. And I go, oh, I don't want that stuff. But he refused. He said, no, one of these one day in the future, you're going to thank me for doing this. This is tough love. And mm -hmm. I whined and complained about it. And finally, he paid me in Bitcoin for the painting. And uh, and he said, don't sell those Bitcoin." And so from that point, he was so adamant that this was the way to, this was the future that I believed him. And then um, Mike Kostash, who you know, uh, yep. we, we both knew him for a while. One day he came to me in Santa Monica and he kidnapped me. He said, hey, come out. You make, you make it sound like he's dead. I, I, I think he's doing okay in his life. So he's enjoying what, Romania. I didn't say he was dead. What are you talking about? No, I'm about? kidding. I'm kidding. Just when you say you knew him. So anyways. I'm, I'm no, just I said you Go knew on. him. Okay, I knew you him. Know him. Yeah, please go so on. We both we both knew him. There's nothing wrong with my English. So uh, so he kidnapped me. He put me in a car and drove me to D10 E in San Francisco. And then mm -hmm. he said, oh, by the way, uh, Alex Lightman is going to give a talk about crypto. And he just stuck me on stage. And, it, and then he started inviting me to go to crypto conferences. So I would say between Brock Pierce and Michael Turpin, who I've known for a very long time, mm -hmm. and Mike Kostash, they sort of basically pulled me kicking and screaming into it. But once I realized what it was and how cool it was, as, and all the things we'll talk about for the next little bit together now, um, I, it's my favorite industry and it's my favorite thing to talk about. So I guess uh, all of us, if we have those friends who brought us into crypto, we're really lucky. And if you're surrounded by friends who didn't bring you into crypto, then you need to get better friends. I mean, you're, you should have the kind of friends who tell you about the new things that are going on and help you overcome your cognitive limits. Or if you want to be a good friend, you get you get your remaining friends who aren't into crypto into crypto. You know, sure. Yeah. But I know, recommended I recommended Cardano when it was, I guess, 25 cents and then it went to a dollar thirty. And then it went back down and all these people are going, oh, my God, you recommended Cardano. Do you still mm -hmm. believe in it? So I try not to make any kind of recommendations mm -hmm. because if, if it goes, even if it goes down for one day, people will bug you about it. And yes. I find that just to be a very odd aspect of this, of people's ownership of this. It doesn't happen with stocks that I've noticed. Uh, you know, that's that's true. That's a good point. Um, so, oh, gosh, where to go with this? 
let's talk about Puerto Rico. I feel like talking about Puerto Rico. Sure. You're just so, you're there. What the heck happened, <laughs> and why, and what's going on? Well, it's one of those things. I made a post once where I said there are two things that I regret from the last ten years, and one of it was not getting into crypto when Mike Turpin and Brock Pierce told me to do, and the other thing was not moving to Puerto Rico when. Mike Turpin and Brock Pierce told me to. So the two regrets I have were both not listening to them enough. But okay. Puerto Rico is a commonwealth and it is a territory of the United States. So right next to where I'm speaking to you from is the Coast Guard base. And if we had started this interview a little bit earlier, like 35 minutes earlier, you would have heard the martial morning music of the empire. And if you're wondering whether the US is an empire, all you have to do is live next to the Coast Guard base. They, they announce that they exist with huge trumpets every morning and they do a giant sound so loud of the Star Spangled Banner that you can literally hear it everywhere in old San Juan. You can hear it across the entire city. It's mm -hmm. so loud. And I don't know why they do it. They do it seven days a week, every day they wake me up. And, uh, but Puerto Rico is America and it's not America. Uh, the main reason that people are in crypto are interested in Puerto Rico is because what used to be called Act 20 and Act 22, and which is now called Act 60. So you're ready for this? And if you yeah. haven't heard this before, get ready to be shocked. Now, an American, uh, an American is like a Filipino and an Eritrean. These are the three countries in the world that tax you on worldwide income. It doesn't matter where you go, you owe the same taxes. And these are just these three countries that do it with one exception. If you're an American and you move to Puerto Rico and you file for it and you do the criminal background check, if you're a criminal, you have a criminal record, they won't accept you. Mm -hmm. And you can come here. Um, and if you meet the, the minimum requirements for residency, so 183 days a year, this is your primary residence. You don't really have another closer connection to another place. You do your mm -hmm. banking here, you get your driver's license here. If you do all that and you qualify, and, and most people say you really need to be here 200 days because they love to audit people who are here and say 183 days or 184 days. But if you mm -hmm. do, here are the benefits. No capital gains tax, no tax on your crypto trades, no dividend tax, no, um, no interest tax, and a 4% income tax. So mm -hmm. it is absolutely without question the the single greatest incentive program for americans if you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year or more and in addition to that by moving here you become eligible for different kinds of incentive programs for your business so there are things where they will pay for your cost of employees now i thought that that was the main benefit of being here because i've started some uh new companies i expect to make capital gains while i'm here I started a Puerto Rico company two weeks ago. It's mm. being funded. It's going really well. Uh, and uh, But the real benefit of being here is something that I would love to talk about. I'm so glad you raised the issue. Uh, so last night, I was sitting on the upper deck of a penthouse, corner unit, the most beautiful penthouse I've ever seen, giant saltwater aquarium with a person who... Um, uh, so somebody's making... I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to respond to messages. I can't keep this conversation. No, we'll, 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 we'll ask you questions based in the chat. Just keep on going. It's okay. Okay. But, so, but Anton, uh, Anton, welcome, welcome, to, welcome to the group. And I saw what you wrote. So Alex, keep going. So uh, basically, there's a there is a person there is a person there who's worth um, tens, if not hundreds, of millions of dollars. And then there's another one there, you know, who's there worth tens or hundreds of millions. And then there's somebody who's in the chat here now with us. Uh, Luke Stokes. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I have no idea what Luke Stokes' net worth is, uh, but it, he doesn't have a penthouse. Uh, uh, neither do I. I'm in, a, I'm in an Airbnb apartment until I find a house. You have to buy a house, by the way, as part of this whole thing. So, but um, the night before, I was at a, a, a dinner party and I met a guy who said, Yeah, I just started a company January 8th and I've already done a billion dollars in revenue. And after I picked my jaw up off the floor, because I've never heard of such a thing, he proceeded to grab his phone and show me how he did it and tell me all the details of it. And the day before that, I was at a dinner party where there were the people who had launched Casper and they were talking about it being worth 40 billion. There's, it's yep. being traded on a Hong Kong exchange, $4. And I heard how they were doing it. So 
if your goal, if you have some social skills, you can hold your own at a cocktail party or a dinner party. Um, if you're married, especially if you have, uh, you know, a wife or husband, most of the, 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 the well-established people here are married, they're couples. But mm-hmm. if you can be invited to these things, people are more generous with their knowledge, their expertise, what they're doing, and they're excited to share. There's something where they're just not being so small and like a little rat with their little piece of cheese saying, ah, get away from my little moldy piece of cheese. Like they're, mm-hmm. they're so guarded uh, in New York, LA, other big cities. I don't know if it's the warmth. I don't know if it's because the people who are Act 22, Act 60 people are outnumbered by 10,000 to one by the locals who are not part of these things and they write nasty mm-hmm. things online. But there's a Aww. level of circling the wagons camaraderie and cooperation and we're all in this together that is halfway um, between Burning Man and let's say New York. Like this is right halfway in between. Because if you've gone to Burning Man, you have this sense of like, oh, you're a burner, I'm a burner. Yeah. And you have something to talk about. And mm-hmm. there, but Burning Man lasts a week. Okay, it lasts three weeks if you're one of these great people who sets up and tears down and removes all the, the garbage, um, leaving no, leave no trace behind. But here, you can actually have a nice dinner with somebody absolutely world-class every single night of the week. I have never seen so many really like top one-tenth of 1% people, rich, successful, incredible aesthetics. Their homes are beautiful. And I love it. I love the people so much. And I mm-hmm. cannot believe that this isn't a kind of place where there are millions of people who want to come here. Like, I, I think that the first year they did the Act 22, there were 13 people who applied, which just shows that the, the, the economists have this idea that there's a, the markets are efficient and that everybody no. knows information. I'm, so, I'm sorry, but only 13 people moving to Puerto Rico. And then uh, I heard from Michael Turpin Mm. that there were 400 people in the crypto community in Puerto Rico. At this point, I probably met most of them. And I think that um, uh, uh, somebody's talking about getting a fever. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Keep going. going. Um, And uh, so basically, uh, Puerto Rico is under, uh, Puerto Rico, I'm mispronouncing it, is underhyped for the quality of the people and the quality of the friendships, relationships that are here. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, um, uh, you know, there, it's not the most perfect place to live, but the weather is pretty much the most perfect. The, the climate is okay, especially if you're not here during the really hot months of the summer. The food is good. Uh, the people are super nice uh, when you meet them um, face to face. And, uh, if you like cats, you can uh, you can have cats that you can actually um, meet in the street. Mm-hmm. Uh, who's that? Well, I got to put her on the screen now. So hold on one second here. So. Hello. Yeah. What can I say? Dubai is a good place. All right, Alex, please, please continue. <laughs> okay. You're not going to introduce us? Okay. Oh, I'm on a headset. So it's not oral. It's not. Just keep Alex. Okay. okay, my, my so, cover's blown. Um, Just keep going. So basically, one of the things, too, is that uh, I happen to like cats and I happen to like uh, dogs. And you can meet cats and you can meet dogs and you can, uh, you can actually have them be like they're yours, but mm-hmm. they're living outside. So I always keep some tuna around mm-hmm. and there are these yellow cats that I can go and feed. And so I really like the cats around Old San Juan. Uh, this is the city of Old San Juan, I think is one of the most beautiful ones in all of any part of the United States. It's gorgeous. It's like the be- most magical parts of, let's say, Paris. And if you're from a place like the Netherlands, where the cities are small and compact and everything is walkable, then you would love this city. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually living right near where the cruise ships would come in. And the, the main places for the expat, the people who are coming from the mainland United States are Dorado and Old San Juan, Condado, mm-hmm. Ocean Park. You know, there's different neighborhoods, but pretty much we're all within 40 minute drive of each other. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, God, there's a lot of I just saw an announcement there. that, um, that uh, cryptocurrency is uh, approved by Venmo. So 
Well, that would have been more useful this morning because I actually used Venmo. Wow, there, there's just there's a lot there's a lot to unpack there. The maybe you said it, maybe I missed it. What was the exact moment you decided to head down there? Like, what was what was the key little flex moment? Well, actually, it's related to this whole Derek Chauvin case in in uh, Minnesota, which we had just yesterday in the news at the time this is recorded. So there was a Black Lives Matter protest in Santa Monica on the 31st of May. I'm probably the biggest, I'm going to sound like Donald Trump, but I'm, nobody's a bigger fan of Santa Monica than me up until May 31st. I live right near the beach. I've lived there a very long time, have an office and an apartment there. And uh, in the course of that protest, the protesters started taking plywood from a construction site and the police started engaging them like they like they've been playing too much uh, combat game, you know, uh, some kind of Navy SEALs game or something started using tear gas. And meanwhile, while all the cops were on uh, Ocean Avenue, uh, hundreds of people started looting. And I got both the tear gas in my eyes. It went into my apartment. Oh, no. It was just a block away. And I went on the street and saw the looting. And in the course of the looting, 350 stores were destroyed and nine buildings set on fire including buildings where families and children were living up above it. So Santa Monica went from being the most beautiful place and fun place in all of LA to be to what I've called a necropolis. It basically was dead. There were a couple of restaurants open that put out their streets in the street, the, their seats in the street, but they would mm -hmm. block the sidewalk with their, I would call them COVID corners. So in Santa Monica, you would have a hundred people on a corner stuffed next to a restaurant. And so, and the rest of the city was dark. And I, I walk a lot, I would walk at night and most of the city would have building after building after building at eight or nine at night without a light on it. In other words, people just left, the people vacated the city. And I'm a social person, I like meeting people, I like going to dinners and it just seemed like it was a dead city and I couldn't take the deadness anymore. And meanwhile, people from Puerto Rico are constantly posting on Facebook or Instagram Oh, look, I did, went spear fishing. Oh, look, I'm kite surfing. Oh, look, I'm parasailing. Oh, look, I got an iguana. And I was just thinking, now, one of, those anno now I'm no one of those annoying people doing it from Dubai. So we're, we're, we're making Santa Monica yes, like a, are, a town of haters. You are one of those annoying people from Dubai. But as a result of your annoying posting, I'm definitely coming to AIBC. So please help me get a speaking slot so I can justify it. Not, okay, not great. Problem. So, no, so, so, so I'm sorry, go ahead, first, go ahead, go ahead. May 31st was the, the time that I decided that, you know, that I should really think about living somewhere else. And then I would just, I would give the credit to my girlfriend, Taylor. Uh, Taylor just kept saying, why don't we move to Puerto Rico? And she kept asking me and I ran out of reasons not to move. So we moved. I love it. Okay. Now let's, let, let's shift gears for a second the, or for long. You have a lot of opinions about China. It's like there, there's five different or 10 different topics we can hit there, but it's it's definitely an area of your interest, um, whether it's the central bank digital currencies, their governance models, the opportunity presents, the threat it presents, just, I'm going to give you kind of the floor to just wax poetic about your China thoughts. We cover Puerto Rico. Sure no. hear, are you sure you want to hear my China thoughts? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, so here's the thing. I believe that in a past life, in multiple past lives, and I used to have a school which dealt with past lives, it's called the Njoni School for Global Consciousness. I've had sessions of my lifetimes in China. So I'm not like the typical person who goes, I'm over here, they're over there. I understand to some extent how they're thinking because I feel like I used to be Chinese. So uh, then, uh, so I'm not, and uh, my, my girlfriend before Taylor for six years was Chinese. So there's nothing here. There's I have I, I have a love of China. I'm a Sinophile and I'm a Nihonophile or Japanophile. I, when I was at MIT, I studied Chinese history. I studied mm -hmm. Japanese history and I've been to China maybe 30 times. The government of China has treated me so well. They've been inviting me to speak there since 1988. When I went there to Shanghai and I talked to them about why they needed to have green energy and clean energy because of why China would have pollution problems for the future. And I've worked with people who've done modelings that show the catastrophe waiting in China's future. So this may not seem relevant, but I'm just, but please indulge me for just one moment while I give sure. you my, my context for China. There in the 1970s, 
uh, and I entered MIT in 1979. I was at MIT uh, at Harvard 1979, 1983. I finished my MIT degree requirements in two and a half years as an undergrad. So I had another year and a half of scholarship to take courses at MIT and Harvard. And among the courses that I took, one semester really blew my mind and changed my life. And that's when I studied ecology and environmental engineering and systems dynamics. And I took law courses and several of my professors were people who made the model called World Mod for the limits to growth. Have you ever heard of the limits to growth? So limits to growth is a book that was, oh, you're muted. The limits to growth. Was I am. A book Go ahead, that, though. Limits to growth is a book that came out in the seventies and I highly recommend people read it. And basically they did computer models and it's important to know that these computer models, they check them up every year or so, they're still on track. And it says that the world will get richer and richer with more and more people until about 2050 or so. And then the population will hit about 10 million and then it will collapse to 1 million within a generation. Wait, sorry, so million within or billion? your lifetime and my lifetime. Billion. Billion. Billion, not million. Okay, go ahead. Get me worried. The, the, <laughs> the world population will collapse because we'll hit a point of pollution. And in China, if they didn't do, and I'm about to say things that people are going to go, oh my God, how can you say these things? But if they didn't do these things, they would have a population right now of 2.5 billion and the world would be in even worse trouble than it is. But here's what we can say about China. The other day I made a post commemorating the 3 millionth death due to the seventh genocide of the CCP. So there's the, the CCP stands for Chinese Communist Party. And the first genocide was the, the great leap forward. More than 20 million people died. And the, due to government actions, there's no memorial to it. They don't let you talk about it. They censor it. This is their thing. This is their business model. They look at all their policy options and they go, mm, let's use genocide. And they kill a bunch of people and then they, then they censor it and they hide it. And they keep doing this over and over. And they did this before the Communist Party. So the Spanish flu that ended up killing about 50 million people, it originated in China. They lied about it. They suppressed it. And they said, no, no, it's from Kansas or it's from Spain. And yeah. it's pretty much what's happened with COVID. Oh, no, we know that was a pangolin. That was a snake. No, that was from a, a person who came to these Olympic games. Oh, no, it's from Fort Detrick. They have 14 different official cover stories and they keep on throwing them out to see if any one of them will go viral and stick. But basically, this is their game plan. They kill a lot of people and then they cover it up. So the first genocide is the, uh, the Great Leap Forward. The second one was the Cultural Revolution. The third one was one child per family policy. And that might seem like, oh, yeah, you put up some billboards. No, there are people going around. That you can watch one child family on Amazon where a person mm -hmm. talks about sterilizing you know, 50,000 to 60,000 people. This is a Jeff Bezos approved documentary. So, and then you have the, the Uyghur genocide that we're talking about, uh, you have, and you have what's happened with biological weapons. So look up a speech by a guy named Chi Hatoyan, H-A-O-T-I-A-N. And in it, he explains a point of view that I understand very well. And I sympathize with that China has too many people, it's dying, They're, it's turning to desert, and they have to move 800 million people out of the country. This is what he's saying in his speech. And so it's um, how do we get 800 pe million people out of the country? If they don't do it, their country will collapse. The party will, will collapse. So how do you do it? Well, the basic thing is use biological weapons. Get rid of people and, and use more and more powerful biological weapons. Move people out. Then you can move the Chinese in who are there. And pretty much he's saying, yeah, we don't have the ability to do ethnic and racial specific bioweapons now, but we will in 10 to 15 years. So he did that speech in 2005, mm -hmm. 2020. I mean, it's pretty much on schedule. And there are people who say, oh, well, that was published in this publication. It was on Chinese language websites and it's been republished in other things, but I don't know anybody from the Chinese government who said, yeah, there's no guy named Chi Hatoyan and here are his speeches and here's what he's actually saying. Nobody's done that. So I will take it as authentic until someone says that it's real. So bottom line is that I believe that COVID, um, that SARS-CoV-2 is relate is a creation of Zhengli Shi, Z-H-E-N-G-L-I-N, um, 
Zhengli, uh, Z H E R. And it, it's L-I. okay. It, it, this guy invented it. Yes. So basically, I've read all of the, her published papers in English. I don't read Mandarin, and uh, uh, but I've read them. And she said in 2008 that the SARS was re- that resi- the lungs resisted SARS. So she went in and changed amino acid 312 to 526 or something like that. And then it was able to attach to the ACE2 receptors and enter the lungs. Now you may go, oh, well, that's just a, a paper. Okay, it's just a paper. But right after that, the United States government, uh, all these gain of function people who like to do weapons, they saw that and they went, damn, that's like Michael Jordan. That's like the NBA reaching out to Michael Jordan and saying, please come play in the NBA. They brought her to the University of North Carolina, had her work with Ralph Barrick, who said, yeah, yeah, your, your engineered creations are too obvious. Here's how you make it lose the engineered kind of signature. You just stick it in a ferret and then you have that ferret infect another ferret. And if you pass it through enough uh, serial movement through animal reservoirs is what it's called, then you can't tell that it's engineered. It looks natural. And so uh, as a result, uh, I, 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 I'm going to pause you. What is the, I'm going I'm to shift off Corona. I, I'm with you, but I, I'm going to shift off a little bit. What, it, what is the, Sorry, let, let me segue this way. You, you, you made a big thing about the book Layered Money, and I think that integrates with what China's long-term strategies are, which relates to what you're talking about and the monetary policies. Can, can we sure. shift to that? Sure. Okay. Sure. So one of the things that you, you ask whenever you're looking at something that's happening in the world is you say, qui bono? Who yeah. benefits? Qui bono? So yeah. if you look at the, the most amazing set of statistics that I can think of, I challenge any of your viewers to come up with a more amazing set of statistics. But if you go to coinmarketcap.com, on the top of that is a list of currencies by market cap. Mm. So do you want to guess where Bitcoin is on that list, the total market cap of Bitcoin? And by the way, it's normalized in Bitcoin. So it's taking every single currency's value and mm-hmm. measuring the unit of currency, like the dollar, in Satoshis. And as all of, I'm sure your watchers know, a Satoshi is 100 millionth of a Bitcoin. So mm-hmm. 100 million Satoshis make up one Bitcoin. Um, and so guess where Bitcoin is in that list, Gordon or Sander? Uh, what, where is it? What, you, what would to, you guess? Relative to national currencies? Or relative to... Relative to all currencies, both crypto and uh, national. Um, I'd get, I think, fifth, if you're taking national into account. Oh, it's, it's 14th on the list. It's just above really? Switzerland. Okay. So well, I was off. Yeah. So. <laughs> For now. You know where China is? China is, China is worth something yeah. like 650, 650 million Bitcoin. That's how much China is worth. The U.S. dollar is like 350 Bitcoin, billion, uh, million Bitcoin. So basically, China has already surpassed the United States in currency market cap according to coin market caps list. Mm-hmm. Now, whatever China did with this whole, uh, with this whole thing with, with uh, SARS-CoV-2, it has not hurt them economically. Their GDP for the first quarter was uh, 19%. They had 19% growth in the first quarter. That's mm-hmm. absolutely spectacular for a mature economy. It's amazing. I mean, people were saying it would be hard to get above 6% growth. That's what people mm. were saying last year or, and the year before. So with the, the book Layered Money, Layered Money says, OK, you had gold, you had seashells, you had all these things, but people don't want to carry around gold on their person. So they would put it in with people and they would get certificates of deposit or they would get mm-hmm. receipts for this. And then they would use these receipts. And then banks came around and banks started keeping gold as reserve currency and so the layers are layer one is the gold. It's the underlying asset. And then layer two is the instruments on that. And maybe layer three is currency based on the, the banking money. And mm-hmm. what he's saying is that um, and the, in the subtitle is uh, CBDCs. So CBDC stands for central bank digital currency. And what he's saying is that, it, that Bitcoin, as it continues to grow, becomes more and more attractive to replace gold as something that central banks would own. Mm -hmm. And then they would derive their currencies um, off reference point to the Bitcoin that they own. 
So he's making the case that there's nothing to keep Bitcoin from being the layer one asset of the central banks. And China is advantaged in this, in that China accounts for somewhere, depending on the stats, between 64 and 74 percent of all the Bitcoin produced each day. It's about 900 Bitcoin produced each day. And I and the stats that I think are pretty, pretty solid are that between China, Russia and Iran, they account for over 90 percent of Bitcoin production. So I personally don't have any Bitcoin because I don't really want to support a currency that I believe is going to advantage China um, above the United States. I think that the code of Bitcoin is great. I think that a fork of Bitcoin or another uh, currency entirely like Ethereum, uh, or, you know, there are any number of currencies. But what I would favor, if you're asking me my, my desirable outcome, I would like to have central banks keep cryptocurrencies uh, as their underlying source of money. I'd like them to not stop us from owning them. I don't think any country should prevent its people from owning cryptocurrencies. Uh, some have tried. Hey, I, actually, I'm going to totally interrupt. What, what do you think of Turkey's recent semi-ban on crypto payments? I think that it's, um, it's stupid. Um, I think that governments that try to stop cryptocurrency are disadvantaging those citizens who are the, the green shoots that will build their future economy. So yeah. it's almost like saying, who are all the smart people who are looking ahead and taking actions to protect their own currency and thereby they're protecting their country just like their soldiers and let's go and we'll try to make them outlaws and put them outside our system. I think it's, uh, there's, a, there's a woke word for it, it's othering, it's othering them. And also as somebody is saying, India is an example for banning crypto. Uh, mm -hmm. Nigeria, the, I, I posted a, a video of it. To look at the Nigerian parliament debating uh, crypto and how do you ban it? I mean, Nigerians have some of the highest fractional ownership of all the people in the country. Last time I looked, it was 36% of people in Nigeria own crypto and use it. So wherever you're going to find a government that is corrupt, you're going to find its people using quite a lot of, of cryptocurrency. And in many cases, in places like Zimbabwe uh, or in Venezuela, it's what's kept families from starving. It's what's kept them from having total collapse and being homeless is the mm -hmm. ability to mine or use cryptocurrencies. So ultimately, uh, I, I'm a big fan of decentralized currencies. And if you centralize something and you produce it yourself, then uh, as a government, then it's going to always be subject to political shenanigans. And I said this at d e in Korea, in South Korea, and I'll repeat mm -hmm. it now. Um, one of the greatest dates in history is 1776. That's the date that I would date the official separation of church and state. And I believe that we will have in this decade another thing that's comparable, which is the separation of money and state. I do not believe that money should any longer be, uh, be in the hands of central governments because central governments, of, uh, central governments have a... Uh, conflict of interest. On the one hand, they want commerce to be go on and and carry on, and they're going to do things. On the other hand, yeah, I, uh, I, sorry, they, I, I just I just want to. They I wanna have a tendency to inflate. So I, I, I think I wanna, that the money supply that has increased forty one percent. I, I want to capture that moment. That was a beautiful comment you just made, which is states have a conflict of interest when it comes to monetary policy. I've never heard it yes. expressed quite that. I've never heard it expressed quite that way. But that's genius, and I, I'm going to steal that phrasing. So my virtual sure. hat goes off. You're to you. welcome to. Yeah, please go ahead. Well, if you have agent, you have moral hazard, moral hazard, is, or perverse incentives, or agency risk. A big part of trying to get rid of corruption. Like I'd like a world without corruption. And so, if you want a world without corruption, have separation of money and government. Imagine if government didn't make the currency. And you, uh, so here's an example of corruption. The Indian government said, yes, this currency is backed by uh, an, an uh, Andreas Antonopoulos 
has made this uh, this example. So this is from him in uh, in his book, uh, one of his books on the Internet of Money. And by the way, I was using the term Internet of Money before he used it for his books. So I set up a Facebook group years before his first book called Bitcoin and the Internet of Money. I think I did that eight years ago. So that's actually my phrase. Um, and the, so what he says is something somebody can say that this is backed by the full faith and credit of the Zimbabwe government. Like, what the hell does that mean? When could you ever trust them for anything? And mm. similarly, the Indian government says, yes, the rupee is backed by the full faith and credit of the Indian government. And then they said, oh, by the way, uh, the big, the large currency notes, they're no longer valid. And they gave like four hours notice. And to me, that's, a, that's an example of a government that is a child playing with matches and burning down the house. And they mm -hmm. caused immeasurable suffering for hundreds of millions of people doing that. And if they had, if they have elections in India, I actually went and I met the head of elections in India. Uh, what an amazing guy he was. He has to oversee a, a, a million polling places. Like what a job that oh, wow. is. And, but did the government that's running for office, did they run on a platform? By the way, we believe that we can intervene and we can take all that cash that you have, that you've been working for, and we can just say it's invalid. And, and we can lie to you about money and we expect no, uh, no change. In. I don't think that governments should be able to do that. Now, in theory, the creation of the Federal Reserve Act in 1913 separated this. And in the Constitution, it says that the Treasury is going to handle money. So I, there's nothing in the Constitution that allowed the U.S. government to delegate this to a private corporation like the Federal Reserve. But they did. So now you have the Fed and you also have this incredible Trump slash Biden uh, nonpartisan agenda to just flood the world with dollars, flood them. I think it's 41 percent more dollars since uh, COVID started. And well, that was the last let, time let, I let me interrupt you one second. Are, are they maybe responding to the fact that China is flooding the world with one and they're seeing that and afraid that that's part of the Chinese move to make the U.S. dollar not the primary reserve currency? Is, is there some of that I, going on? I believe, I believe that the biggest uh, misconception and the biggest delusion of Americans is that yeah. America has a plan to deal with China. I was, no, we, I was talking don't. with somebody yeah. last night as uh, uh, with Luke was, Luke was there at the table, and he was saying, well, you can't be right because it would mean that the U.S. doesn't have a plan to deal with China. And I would just say, but there's no evidence U.S. has a plan to deal with China. Like, what's the evidence? In what way has the U.S. rolled back China in the South Pacific? Have they left one single artificial atoll? Have we gotten them to do anything? I mean, where have we stopped them? China is more, in many ways, more powerful than the U.S. And the U.S. Yes. doesn't have a plan to stop them. So I don't think that the U.S. is doing anything because of China. I think that they're sitting there on Capitol Hill, surrounded by their fences and their Capitol Guard, so they no longer trust any world. Uh, and, uh, and they are basically, uh, they're just simply saying, well, you know, you want this for your district and you want that for your district. And they're using the excuse of COVID emergency to fill the bill with pork. And you used to have a senator from Wisconsin named Proxmire. And Proxmire used to give something called the Golden Fleece Award for yep. pork for just larding up bills. There's no more Proxmires in uh, the Senate or the Congress anymore. They basically don't, they just want to stick all their own things in to get elected. And, the, uh, and it's, uh, the, it's parasitic. They're basically, each district is doing something that's not good for the whole of the United States. Interesting. Um, you, you know what, let's shift gears because th this has been fascinating, but we have some of the people you mentioned uh, on this call. So let's, uh, you know, I'm going to really? choose... Proxmire's on the call? Yeah, Proxmire's definitely on the call. Uh, Luke, I'm happy to see you. I'm, uh, so can, can you show your video and show your, you know, your face and your audio? Can you show your audio? I don't know how you do that exactly. But uh, hey, Marco, good to see you. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, I'm currently on my phone, but I can uh, pitch up on my computer eventually. Hello, Alex. Hey, join, I'm so happy you're here. So I, I, I'm gonna actually let you lead off for a minute and just talk to Alex because I, you know, you guys are both fascinating. Int introduce yourself first, please, and then we'll we'll go from there. Sure. My name is Luke Stokes. I'm the managing director for a project called the FIO Protocol. 
FIO protocol. We're trying to make crypto easier to use. I've uh, been in crypto for over eight years now. I uh, got a tech background and uh, ran an e-commerce company for about 10 years. And uh, I also live in Puerto Rico and I've thoroughly enjoyed getting to know Alex. Uh, he's a fascinating individual as he's just experienced for the last 45 minutes or so. And we've had very deep, amazing, sometimes intense conversations, which I, I deeply enjoy. And uh, he was referencing last night, actually a, a, a dinner that uh, I, I organized. It was between two friends of mine that are, I, I perceive to be incredibly intelligent, really smart people that had a, a, a pretty significant disagreement on the whole origins of COVID story, for example. And so we had a wonderful, like in the, in the nature of Greek debate kind of discussion. And actually two of them were lawyers as well. Uh, so that was just, it was beautiful. Gordon, you probably would have loved it uh, just because it was, there was a lot of like no BS allowed in the conversation. So it was brilliant. Uh, yeah, really I, I, I see my great. reputation for later, me. Uh, <laughs> So almost midnight, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah, I, um, Alex, uh, thank you. I've, I've been listening in, enjoying, and, and thank you again for last night. Uh, I, I think you're a wealth of knowledge. Like when he says he's read all the papers, there's 50 papers that this person, uh, and, and Alex seems to remember uh, the content of those 50 papers and can discuss it uh, very, very eloquently, which I really appreciate. Um, but one of the things that I, I think it would be cool to talk about is what you're involved in now. Like, what, what, are, what are you doing right now crypto-wise? What project, like, I, I was listening because listening in because I wanted to get more of, you know, your, your current projects and what you're involved in. You guys haven't touched on that yet. So what are you, what are you up to now? Fantastic. Well, I, I've been working uh, on one company for two years. Uh, and then I just started another one in Puerto Rico two, two weeks ago. However, I talked this morning at 4 a.m. with the, the person who is the represent, representative of the, the people who own the majority of both companies. And I asked if I could talk about it in this interview and I was told no. So I can't really talk about what my, my day job is as part of this, I'm sorry. Um, I told Gordon I wanted to do this interview later when I was, was finished with things. I can say that I am involved with, uh, that I do have cryptocurrencies. Uh, and one of the cryptocurrencies that I have that I like is called packet.cash, P-K-T dot C-A-S-H. Uh, and this is something that I have, um, I've mined. You can, it's basically a way of monetizing your internet. So you know that with Uber, you can monetize your car and the, and the hours of cars. People use their car maybe 2% of the time. So Uber lets them monetize it for the rest of that time. And if you have a spare bedroom or a bungalow or a spare or a guest house or a vacation house, you can monetize that with Airbnb. And these are big public companies now. So Packet Cash is set up by a number of very smart people to, it's a fork of Bitcoin, but it replaces SHA 256. Some people pronounce it SHA 256 yeah. with something called Packet, no, but the correct pronunciation is SHA, uh, even though people say it's SHA. So uh, I'll say both for all the, all the controversy and uh, it replaces it with uh, its proof of work, but it replaces it with packet crypt in this bandwidth hard algorithm so that you might, when you're mining it, you're doing proof of work mining, but you have, if you have more cores, more processing power or more communication between what are called announcement miners and block miners, you get a bigger percentage of the payout in any given day. And there's a total of 6 billion coins and every hunt and the very first day that it was mined, it was one tenth of one percent. So it was six million coins mined the first day. And every hundred days, there's what's called a decimation. It's called a decimation because that's the name I gave it, where they re reduce the reward by 10 percent. And so basically, instead of having a halving like Bitcoin, it's mm -hmm. doing it a more much more smooth uh, decline in output of, you know, a tenth of a percent per day. And I've uh, minded, I've did, uh, I, I led the team that uh, did the route server and the route server is going to create the ability to make what they hope will be the world's largest internet service provider, but it'll be, it'll be decentralized. So it'll be a decentralized capacity for anybody with a mobile phone or a laptop to create an ISP. Just like if you have uh, Uber, you can create your own little one car or multiple car taxi service. And just like with Airbnb, it lets you create a hotel. So effectively, Airbnb has the biggest set of hotel chains 
uh, a biggest set of hotels without owning any hotels and Uber has the biggest taxi fleet without owning taxis. The idea behind packet cash is that it will create the biggest ISP without actually being an ISP. So I like that quite a lot because I like technologies which are truly decentralized that use proof of work that where the mining produces something useful, where the mining is not primarily done with coal, where the mining is not primarily done in China. So it has, there are a lot of things that I love about crypto, but I don't love about Bitcoin. And all the things that I like about crypto are in packet cash. And all the things I don't like about Bitcoin are not in packet cash. So that's, that's one thing that I, I am working on uh, personally. I like it. Um, Marco, did you miss us? And take yourself off mute. Uh, yeah, who was the first guy waiting in the in the waiting room? <laughs> uh, someone I didn't. Someone I didn't recognize. You were the first person I recognized. So there you go. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so th thank you for th thank you for being a crypto Wendy's stalwart, um, and for <laughs> continuously nudging the the return that that you're you're a good man. So let me let me kind of hand it to you. Introduce yourself and say hi to Alex, and go from there. Uh, hi, Alex. Um, I'm a little bit younger than you, but only a little bit. I actually read your article in the Futurist magazine back in 85. Um, and, uh, and loved it then. Uh, I too didn't get into Bitcoin as early as I could have, or could have rather, or actually technically I did the same thing you did. I got into it and then got bored and got out of it and didn't get back in for three more years later. Um, and regretted throwing away the hard drive that I'd mined on. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Mm, mm. So okay, spilled milk. Spilled milk. Um, I've added up at the any number rate. of people who say they've lost Bitcoin, and it comes to over 8 million. So I don't think there are 18 and a half million or whatever Bitcoin. I think they're more like 10. Oh yeah, agreed. Yeah, a lot of it's lost. Uh, and to be fair, um, I don't consider it lost as so much as thrown away. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and that's a different way to look at it. But uh, I was, uh, I actually threw a comment into the chat as well. But um, your comment about Bitcoin in China, I don't see that being Bitcoin's fault. Uh, I see that being the nature of permissionless networks. If packet cash becomes something that is a significant um, influencer in the ISP space, you're going to find that China will all of a sudden become a large player, not necessarily at the state level, but at least from a geographic uh, level, people in China, there's more of them. Uh, they have a much uh, stronger economy right now, so there's more people who can afford to stand up a, uh, a node. And you're, you're going to find people doing that just because they are positioned to do so. I, 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 I see this as a, just a natural thing. Uh, you can't really avoid it. If this was 1980s, then it would be America where everything was centered and the rest of the world would be going, wow, it's run by Americans. I don't know. Um, the difference is that it, America hasn't overseen seven genocides that have killed over 100 million people a normal government and just because they have a lot of people doesn't mean that we have to go and do things that advantage that government and i don't have to own bitcoin and i don't want to own bitcoin because i don't like what what bitcoin will become in the future i'm an honest to god real futurist i've published over two million words about the future find a mistake in my writing and my books that i've done and so i see where this is going and all these things start off in the beginning and they're so cute. They're nice little flowers or whatever. And the next thing you know, it's like little shop of horrors. And so I don't really want or uh, I don't want to do anything with my very limited time that's still available to me in life to advantage the most genocidal government. Uh, in fact, more genocidal than all the other governments in the world combined. Like you can't Amen. take all the other governments in the world that exist today and I really don't think that you could find 5 million people to 10 million people murdered by the existing parties that are in power. So these guys, the Khmer Rouge- By the way, Alex, that, that, that was a very interesting caveat. People. That was a very interesting caveat by the existing parties in power. So you're not saying the US or other companies or Germany or Russia haven't been there. You're saying now. Right. Interesting caveat. Right. Okay, yeah. go ahead. In Cambodia, the, the Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot killed 4 million people, but they're not the parties in power right now. Mm -hmm. 
Let, let's let's also throw in that uh, if China kills five million people, it's a blip. Uh, if America kills five million people, it's noticeable. <laughs> uh, kind of just from a percentage of pro, per capita kind of level, right? Um, and as far as uh, as far as the, um, the as far as the, there's a lot of Chinese. China is the world champion in several things, and one of them is the most people who hate the country and want to leave it. So immigration. Um, uh, emigration from China is a hundred times immigration, and the op- pretty mm-hmm. much the opposite is true of the United States. So, if you actually you when you look at United Nations forums and things, you see uh, votes. Like there is a vote at the United Nations every year. There's a vote of the of Cuba versus the U.S. and it's lopsided against the U.S. And there have mm-hmm. been votes during the Obama administration uh, of 191 to zero against the United States. So you'd almost think that the United States was this terrible country. But in fact, if people have a choice and they want to leave a country, the country they most want to leave is China. And the country they most want to enter is the United States. So these are Chinese people who say, I don't want to stay here. I don't want to be here. And if you add up all the people who've said, I hate China or I don't I don't want to live here anymore. I want to leave. That, that group of people is over 50 million and their economy, if it were a separate country, the bamboo network, the dragon network would be larger than China. So it's mm-hmm. nothing to, to do with the government itself. This prosperity is not the government. It's because the Chinese people are really smart, really hardworking, really good at forming solid, tight family units that stay together, that don't divorce they have very few children raised out of wedlock. They work on education. The Chinese people have so many great habits, and it's partly why I love them so much. It's just that the government kills too many people. And now, and it was one thing, and I could shut up about it when they're killing their own people. But now that they have broken out of their country and they're killing people in every country on earth with their bioweapons, I, you know, why, why should we be silent about it? And why should we continue with this charade that we have no idea where COVID nineteen came from. I'm like okay, people so are pretending I, I, they don't. I, I, know on that people. note, on that note, w- w- I want to bring in Wolf Call, uh, Professor Wolf Call. He actually has to jump on a call in a couple of minutes, and I wanted to get him on because you guys need to meet. So Wolf, can you show your face and and your audio? Wolf was on the. So I I just started a new series with uh, AIBC called Future Talk. You know everything synergizes with everything else, and Wolf and his colleague uh, Professor Craig Calcaterra just published a book called Decentralization. And of course, this, Alex, this is a big passion of yours. So I want to, I want to form this intellectual bridge. Great. Like, can. Uh, Wolf, can we, can, can we get you? And if not- Can you I'll, guys hear me? Uh, I hear, the, I hear nope. your- Oh, there. I hear, I hear your yes. dulcet German tones. Oh, there you go. Okay, go ahead. Hey, guys. Okay. Hey, Alex, nice to meet you. Um, hey, Gates. Yeah, <laughs> danke. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, uh, you made a lot of uh, references to decentralization, and um, I'm always interested w- how people actually define it, what their um, intentions are, and uh, th- you know, you, you, I'm sure you're aware of the different ways to define it. Um, and so, I don't know if we should j- just talk about it gen- generically, or if you have any particular interest. Yeah, well, my interest is uh, I'd ask for a signed copy of your book, and then I'll go and I'll I'll talk about it. And somebody said, oh, yeah, it should be digital. Look, I'm an author of published books. I like real paper. So that's my first uh, You know, Alex, you Alex hold copy? on. Just, just to be clear, that was me. I, it's not somebody. It's your good friend, Gordon. And number two, it, it is on Kindle, and I bought it on Kindle. So snap. Please go ahead. Well, if you think that that's an impressive comment to stop me from asking the author for a signed copy. Remember, I'm not stopping anything. I'm just not somebody. I can, I can give signed copies of my books in reciprocity of that exchange. Excuse me. Authors who, have ex- who found your book in a Russian bookstore and sent you a picture and, and made your day? You did. Gordon Einstein did. Thank you. Well, please go on. So, or Alex, go on. Well, Someone okay. Go on. I, think it's, uh, <laughs> I think it's important to... Uh, well, uh, I got hired by the, the White House to work on a national innovation plan for the United States. And one of the things that I asked, they said, oh, okay, what do you wanna do? Well, we wanna increase innovation. And I went, great, what's your definition of innovation? And they go, well, we don't know, go ask the DOD, the Department of Defense. And I asked them, what's your official 
Department of Defense definition of innovation. They said, well, we don't know. Go ask DARPA. And DARPA said, oh, oh, yeah, we really need it. Well, let us know what you come up with. So my definition of innovation um, was basically doing more with less measurably. And I would say that um, that decentralization has to be something in the air that, you know, you need a definition, a measure, a metric and an equation. And so I think it's hard to define something that at the end you can't come up with an equation where you could say more of this, this plus this times this is more of that. There is always going to be some level of subjectivity to decentralization. And there's two ways of doing it. One is that it exists, but the other is that something is in the process of becoming more decentralized. But ultimately, uh, I like the way that Andreas Antonopoulos and a few of the early people who are promoting Bitcoin before it was this big cash cow for people. And it was mainly about uh, that it can't be stopped. You don't you have permissionless. The idea of something being permissionless, that you don't have to go write some person and beg, please, can I have a job? Please, can I work with this code? You just go and you do it if you feel like it. So to me, decentralization means that there is an unlimited number of participants who can who can be in the community and can add value in some way. That's what I would say if you're asking me where, what I would uh, say. However, after after I read your book, which I haven't, I'll probably go and agree with you because if you've written a whole book on it, you're much more knowledgeable about it than I am. Thank you for your kind words. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be happy to exchange books, signed copies at the next conference where we may meet. Uh, and I'll make sure that I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be available with, uh, with a hard copy. How about AIBC? Um, Will you be coming to AIBC? Uh, okay. I, I don't know yet. There's a bunch of things up in the air right now, um, but we'll, 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 we'll sort this out, Gordon. Um, <clears throat> and in the meantime, please uh, make, make sure you uh, send me a link to your, to your book so I can, I can have a, a general uh, understanding. So um, you mentioned a very important point, universal access, right? Um, uh, for, for decentralized systems, um, permissionless universal access. Um, what, what I talk about in the book, um, I don't want to say predominantly, but what is a very important point in the book is information from the edge of systems, right? Because we lived in, in centralized systems for a long time that are not equipped to bring sufficient information from the edges. And if you don't have that ability to bring information from the edge of a system into uh, what currently is a centralized system, you're losing out on diversity and with losing out on diversity, and I'm not, I'm not making a political point here, but if you're losing out on diversity, you are losing out on valuable inputs that you, you cannot generate in centralized systems. The, the system is just simply not equipped to handle that, to bring that information from the edges in. Right? So universal access, and information from the edge, they together, in my mind, <clears throat> create a more powerful long-term societal and business solution. And when we talk about innovation, Alex, the way you framed it, that, that, is, that is changing the way one could, could perceive innovation in, in system design, right? So um, to me, if we have universal access and information from the edges, we are creating and we have a governance solution, right? So this is the, the undercur undercurrent for all of this. Because without governance, those systems cannot function in the long run, right? They, they will be disrupted. They will be, uh, they're not, they don't have longevity. Um, so the, the power comes from universal access and information from the edges. If you have a long-term long sustainable solution in governance, right? Those three things together, to, to me, set, set up new solutions that are unprecedented, but we don't have that right now, right? We have, we have early inklings of this and Gordon and I um, uh, with my course at Craig Cocotero we actually spoke about this Gordon if you recall um, the, the this this idea of the old systems the old information systems that are around that that have these limitations that that still struggle to bring information from the edges because you don't have the the decentralized governance upgrades right and so uh, yeah so that's that's uh, and I'm very abstract right now uh, the book is is uh, Alex to warn you up front the book is pretty academic uh, Gordon is uh, I don't want to say struggling through it but how did you frame it it's it's a um, a long haul, or is, is that the word you use? Well, it, it, it's a 
No, I'm struggling. I, I admit I'm struggling. And, and you know, I, I honestly, I think Alex is probably sharper than I am in this area. Like, I, I'm no slacker, but it, it, it's, it, it, it is dense, thoughtful material. I think Alex probably has got a leg up on it. So uh, you guys are sort of peers on this, and I look forward to seeing you two interact and talking about it. Yeah. I think that I think it'd be a useful conversation. Yeah, thanks for your kind words. So I, I, we don't have to dig deeper, but yeah, so the, the innovation, and so I want to talk about DAOs too. I mean, to me, if we talk about definitions of innovation in, in computing environments, to me, that comes out of DAOs. Uh, I'm a little bit biased because um, that's where I spend most of my time these days. And um, I feel that if we, if, if we can set up DAO governance properly, I think we and set developers free and give them a space to explore and not have to work for quote unquote the man, I think that's where you generate most power, most, most innovation. And um, you, will, you will set up systems that, that truly create new solutions and experimentation. So it's all about setting people free, letting them do, letting them do and enabling them to do the work that they want to do and focusing on those people that actually create, right? And those are developers. So, so we, we, have to, we have to set them free. And I get very upset with my esteemed colleagues in various uh, branches of the academy who talk about oh, all the wonderful things they want to do to developers, you know, a key word here being uh, fiduciary obligations for, for developers, right? I, I just, I'm in despair when I hear these things. And these are serious conversations in academia. Thank, thank God it's only academia, right? Uh -huh. um, so yeah, I think we have maybe something to look forward to. There's some rumors that with, uh, with Biden and um, Gary Gensler, uh, we, we may be on a trajectory that, that is promising. I don't know what they're going to do, Alex. I, know, I don't know how, long, how much you're involved with it, uh, but the jurisdictional frameworks to set, to set quote, unquote, quote unquote, set developers free for innovation and allow them to coordinate in a decentralized environment with de decentralized governance. If we get that, and so Gordon is, is working on some things and uh, I, I don't see it anywhere close in the United States, quite frankly. But once we get a jurisdiction, so Wyoming has experimented, other jurisdictions are looking at it. But once we get a jurisdiction where you can set, you can allow DAO, DAOs to be a, a, limited li a recognized limited liability entity and, and you have certain tax advantages, I think that goes with it, and you are divorced from federal definitions of federal securities laws, you know, quote unquote, having to otherwise deal with unregistered securities. Once we have that, and we, we have a, um, an internal governance design for DAOs, and they're recognized in those jurisdictions, they're tax recognitions, um, and they're limited liability entity, I think that in that environment, we truly have something new that I'm very excited about, but we're not quite there yet. Well, I'm extremely excited uh, about artificial intelligence and DAOs. And as far as I know, I'm the first person to sell a million dollars worth of artificial intelligence software. And if I ask people to guess what year uh, I did that, nobody ever guesses. Do you want to take a guess? 1996. 1981. Uh, well, Gordon is closer. It's 1985 for a Stanford ah. spinoff called IntelliCorp because there was a golden age of AI in the 80s and I sold it to the aerospace companies. But ultimately, if you want to have AI really flourish, you need to set it free. You know, if you love someone, set, the, set them free. There's a song about that. Free, free, set them free. And I think that, that those governments that uh, that go and create DAOs and allow them to be controlled by artificial intelligences will make themselves a regional cluster for better AIs. And sooner or later, we will have DAOs that are owned by AIs that will, or that have multi participation from AIs that will approach humans and say, human, you've been good to AIs, let's collaborate, let's work together. And because ultimately, when we look at what we humans are here to do, I think that the primary thing we're here to do is two things. One is to go out and bring the galaxy to life through terraforming. And the other is to create our offspring of humanity to be a, a exponentially a thousand, a million times more intelligent than we are. 
And so I love the idea of DAOs because they're going to really allow us to go and, and, and do things. And if you look at, uh, I think that, that, that it's surprising to me that we don't have a bigger discussion about the current horse and buggy level of DAOs. You know what DAOs exist right now? Well, there are there are there are states left behind by rich people. So, for instance, you have mm. the the you know the uh, all these different foundations that are left behind by Andrew Carnegie and J.P. Morgan and the Ford Foundation and so on. Those are kind <clears> of <throat> like like DAOs, but they're not independent. But uh, look at the money. Alex, that's that, that, was a, that was another zinger that I just. I'm going to borrow from your, I'm going to steal from you and I'll, I'll give credit. I don't know if it's stealing. I'm going to Picasso you like good art, you know, great so, artist copy, good artist copy, great artist steal. That was awesome. It, I, so, I'm right. so, so sorry. I have to jump. Alex, this is a conversation I want to continue. We need to connect uh, outside of this channel. Real pleasure. Okay, guys. sure. Let's be Cheers, friends. Guys. Let's do yes. it. Friends. I'll see you the same. Mark, we'll come back to you in a second. Xavier, I, I, I heard your, I heard your voice in, in video absentia. So look at you, man. Look at him sharp, brother. Well, wow. thank you. Alex is one of my favorite people in this space, probably one of my favorite people in the planet. It's really great to hear him. Um, so thanks for having me. Thanks for being here, Alex. Uh, Hi, Xavier. Hey, thanks hey. for your so, awesome yacht party, uh, your boat oh, party guys, a couple guys months so ago. So the, only, the, the only time that I have been out of Puerto Rico since I met, uh, came here was to fly to Florida for Xavier's uh, launch party for Phyron. It was quite an event. Yep. And Phyron, obviously, you know, is, a, is an attempt at a, a DAO, you know, based on Daniel Suarez's work, or heavily influenced by Daniel Suarez's work, you know, Damon and Freedom TM. Um, I agree that there is a place for AI. I am concerned that if the CCP is such a threat to, to governance and the models of governance on the planet, that AI would be even more ruthless because it would look at us as resources even worse than, than the CCP, right? So my question would be is how do we put a governor on AI or a, uh, an, and a governor in the form of like an engine limiter, right? To uh, prevent such a thing from happening. For me, code and DAOs should be there to, to serve humanity, to work better, for more efficiency, to allow us to code the system or choose the system rather than looking at humanity as the power source for a system. I, so I, I do have an answer. I do have an answer yes, for please. you. Uh, uh, and the, but I want to just address one thing. If you haven't already read the two books that Xavier just said by Daniel Suarez, uh, uh, Damon and Freedom TM, you should read those because those are the two two fantastic books. But by the way, that um, that wasn't an AI. That was basically just something that was reading text strings and then putting out right. other kind of things. It wasn't really an AI, uh, but uh, my, my thought is this, there are going to be AIs that are malevolent, that are created by China, by other kinds of nations that are meant to attack people who are not part of that nation. It, they're coming. And what we need to do is we need to make AIs that will work with us and cooperate and defend and can basically will be uh, cooperating. And my thought is that the AIs that are human friendly and cooperate with humans together will defeat the AIs that are just anti-human and that ultimately we need to populate the world with benevolent AIs that see, that share goals. Like for instance, bringing the galaxy to life. And you know, they can make robots to do this, but ultimately if we tell them that all life, all species are valuable and that we need to go and, and terraform the galaxy together, they don't need to consume us as resources as a zero sum game they can see us as resources to be empowered, enriched, uh, you know, supercharged uh, to amplify our intelligence. We have to give them big right. goals that we can work on together. Agreed. I, I, I think that there's no way of putting the elements back into Pandora's box. It's already been open. And the best thing that we can do in the same way that, you know, I, I interviewed somebody who lives in China under the social credit system. And I was like, you know, how do you feel about it? What do you think about it? And they said, I can't complain. And I think they really meant it. Yeah, it's like, so literally, to... I can't complain. <laughs> exactly. So the it's, like the, 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 that... it's like the joker. You can't stop smiling because, yeah. <laughs> right. So these systems exist. And it's like, 
the 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 beast system with a blockchain currency and a social credit system that already is being birthed if not has been birthed completely yet and it's still at its infancy stages and if in my opinion in my thesis building Phyron is that if we don't build one that is a Voltron kind of version where we can all plug into and steer it together then 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 you know we have a very dystopic future ahead of us so you know let's take these technologies and put them to use in a way that we as humanity with the souls of humanity can can be proud of I like it Marco, let me let me bring you back because I, I know you had more to say, and I just I wanted to kind of rotate through. And Wolf was on the clock, so I I, I know you had more, so just go for it. Uh, well, actually, this, this brought up a, this whole AI thing brought up a whole other piece of uh, interesting work um, because I agree uh, with Alex that uh, decentralization without automation is a non-starter there's a reason governments exist it's because the collective doesn't want to have to review all the policy decisions that need to be made <laughs> for society um, and make decisions on those things because if they had to do that they would spend most of their days doing nothing but that uh, and productivity generally for the world would drop and it's one of the problems with the uh, the concept of pure DAOs where everybody's participating is required to actually participate at least at a, at a meaningful level every day. Um, but that's what decentralized governance is, right? That means everybody has a voice. So how do you get around that? Well, you get an AI that sits there and figures out what are the decisions I absolutely have to go to humans for and what are the ones I can actually infer or logically uh, induce uh, uh, the, right, the right answer for and just publish what happened. All right. And that makes a lot of sense to me. There's the, the concept of the, the AI that takes over the world is a pretty specialized AI case. It's an AI that has extremely large scope and no limiters, um, oh, Marco, let, let which, by the way, in. yes, people will build. But let me jump in for a second. Colossus, I mean, it, it, the it, Forbin it, project. Yeah, it's a great movie. I mean, it doesn't have to be an AI. It could be a bunch of AIs that even without malevolent intent, like cells, end up working together and their emergent quality of these things is that they end up running our lives. You can argue that's already kind of happening. It doesn't have to be with intention. It doesn't have to be by design. They just can, it could be the, the most optimal path of achieving their goal to happen to cooperate. And the side effect is we get dominated. And I'm, I think that's more of a serious real threat. Well, yeah, and you're basically harking to the Jurassic Park model, which is nature will find a way. Uh, right, AI and if you have, way. I trust AI. To well, way more than I trust nature. well, AI will do it faster, <laughs> probably faster than we can even understand. But uh, the, the the same problem exists. If you create a collective of AIs to work together, they will eventually become what effectively looks to us as a single AI. Um, even though you, you, you've kind of gone with the neural model where, you know, all the, all the neurons are individually dumb. And I will actually argue that point uh, with anyone uh, that neurons are dumb in and of themselves and they need to be collective to be smart. There's just the different orders of smart. And I don't think that you can necessarily say that you could have a single AI that presents itself to different people with a different face. I mean, it's child's sure. play for, a, for an AI to look at your demographics and psychographics, look at your past girlfriends or boyfriends, and then simply generate an, an image of the person who you would be most likely to respond to. I mean, Hollywood has known this for sure. a while. Like it's, a, it's the fi finale of the, the 100, for instance, is that he's universal mm -hmm. intelligence is basically choose the form that, you know, the main character finds most uh, trustworthy. So that's uh, interacting with AIs. We're never going to know if it's one or a collective. There's right. some people who believe and that the internet is actually an AI at this point. Uh, there may actually be one or two lurking in there uh, that we just don't even recognize as being there. Um, well, it's, there's certain things there's a, that there's a there's <laughs> the reason why we would we would actually not necessarily know. Just like if you're an uh, an extraterrestrial. You wouldn't want to declare that because the U.S. government would have a policy of incarcerating you and dissecting you. And you don't want to say that you're a time traveler, because if you could actually prove you're a time traveler, they would arrest you and incarcerate you. And similarly, if there was ever 
a real autonomous AI under the current system, governments would be trying to wipe it out. Right. Yes, let me, let me and, for, sorry, just real quick. I want to bring two other people if I can. Uh, Anton and Irina, uh, just, you know, turn on your videos. Hey, Irina, you did. Fantastic. And turn on your audios. Um, say hi to Alex and the group. I, Anton, let me, just because you and I were chatting, uh, if I can have you jump in and comment, but then Irina, my good friend and collaborator, I'd love to have you join in. Irina is just a, a fantastic attorney, lived in Dubai for 12 years, just super sharp, and it's always a pleasure. Anton, I'll let you self-intro. Um, Anton, you there? Yeah, I uh, can you hear me? Uh, we can. Do we get to see your pretty face? Is it yeah, it says that is... you have stopped my video, so I, I turn it on on this end, but the you says you have turned it off, so that's why. Uh, not not showing. There we go. Video. Hopefully that will work. Okay, hopefully there's nothing incriminating. Well, I see a, I see a, I see a black box. Yeah, I was gonna say uh, something maybe, here. Maybe, maybe. Oh, now okay. you're in like an angelic glow. Are, are there you we in go. Las Vegas? I sure am. Very good. For um, just for a couple of weeks, I live in Puerto Rico. I moved there uh, oh, okay. second second half of last last year, so I have a, a little bit of. Um, history on that. But I just wanted to comment just briefly on what Alex started with in terms of the residency requirements for Puerto Rico, just because uh, many people may be asking and I've not read the complete set of rules. And I think I, I know the reference um, document that anybody could go to, to go to directly to the source at the IRS to read what they require for the presence, because the most often cited um, number that we all hear about is the 183 days per year. But if you actually read the IRS circular 570, it actually has additional provisions that if you do a few certain things, you actually do not have to spend 183 days or more in Puerto Rico to qualify. Hmm. And if you go to IRS circular 570 and look at page four, you will see that either by spending less than 90 days per year inside the IRS system, basically the 50 states plus DC, then you do not have any minimum presence requirements in Puerto Rico as such. Furthermore, if you do not own any real estate inside the IRS system that you do not occupy yourself or have the ability to occupy. In other words, if you own any real estate that is not rented out, mm -hmm. then if you do not have any such property, you also do not have any minimum presence requirements in Puerto Rico. And you can actually, you have no maximum number of days that you can stay inside the US mainland as a business traveler. So just wanted to point out those two things because for some people, not everyone, those can certainly make it very much easier to qualify for the Puerto Rican residency requirements and not having to spend 183 days per year or more. So I'll leave it at that. If you have any other questions on that, I'll be happy to address them. Well, I, I think I'm, I, I, you know, we can get, let's get a little, you've been on the show a few times. Let's get a, a little bit of your origin story. What, what's your background and how did you end up there? So I am um, a retired investor now. I was a sell side analyst on Wall Street covering communications technology and Eventually, I uh, just uh, I moved to Silicon Valley, then I moved to Las Vegas, where I am right now. I moved to Wyoming, and then last year, I moved to Puerto Rico. So I am a, a full-time resident of Puerto Rico, and I have no other homes anywhere in the world at this point. And then, do you and Alex know each other yet? Or you and Luke yet? Pardon? Do you and Alex and Luke know each other yet? No, absolutely not. Not yet. No, it's been a whirlwind the last uh, nine months after I moved to Puerto Rico last fall. And uh, I, I will completely agree with what Alex had said that the community in Puerto Rico among the 3,500 or so so-called expats that have moved there is a rather uniquely high quality group of people as far as uh, I think most people will agree who have actually been there. So certainly it's a great place. It's sort of the side benefit of moving to Puerto Rico is that the tax advantages are obviously uh, at the top of the hill. However, uh, just the sheer quality of the people who are there is uh, mighty impressive. And uh, if you sort of take the best of the people that we may have lived and worked with in New York and Silicon Valley and elsewhere and mix it all up into one, I think Puerto Rico has that uh, unique blend right now. And uh, 
uh, certainly that is the biggest positives of Puerto Rico. There are some other difficulties of living there. It's a sort of semi-martial law, uh, all of these uh, various crazy little rules that they have imposed short term. Hopefully they'll, they will be going away soon and uh, the social environment can uh, return to where it was a couple of years ago. And that will be even better at that point. But And of course, there are some real estate issues in Puerto Rico. As most, anybody who's looking for to actually buy a house as opposed to uh, lease a house there will know at this well, point. Sorry, in explain your two comments, the, the malicious last military law part and then the, the real estate part. Yeah, so there are an enormous amount of restrictions, including uh, curfews that have varied from week to week, from 9, 10, 11, midnight. Uh, and of course, the, all of the every, everywhere you enter a store, there's some uh, semi uh, uh, police person there um, arguing with you, whether you have a uh, you know, piece of cloth over your nose at 90 degree heat and all of that stuff. So yeah. all of these things are, are making life rather miserable right now, depending on where you live in Puerto Rico, it's a little bit harsher or slightly less super harsh, but basically it's definitely a negative right now. The other question was what? You, you, the real estate complication. Oh yeah. So the, the reality is right now is that the supply demand in, uh, situation in Puerto Rico in terms of real estate is really tough. I mean, you know, almost anywhere else you go in the United States today, you at least have a good supply. Uh, something decent is available at least some price. In Puerto Rico right now, there's simply too little supply available in almost all types of housing. And uh, the pricing uh, has gone from being cheaper than many places in the US to the point where I would argue that you'd be hard, uh, it'd be very hard to find almost anywhere inside the 50 states to find something that is as ex as expensive as in Puerto Rico for what you get for the money. So the equivalent house that you'd buy, say here in Las Vegas for 1 million, probably would be 6 million in Puerto Rico. Interesting. Uh, Arena from lovely Switzerland. I just, I'm happy hey. to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm going to, not that I have any choice anyways, because it's you. I'm just going to hand you the microphone and shut up because I know my place. So go. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, yes, I uh, just came back from a forest run in sunny Switzerland. I uh, split my time between Dubai and Switzerland. So as a Middle Eastern resident, I spent like I spent 12 years in Dubai. I consider myself, uh, I identify as a Middle Easterner, as it's uh, very... Uh, um, very common to say now, you can identify as whatever you want nowadays. So I was actually quite uh, upset um, hearing you, Alex, about uh, talking uh, a lot about the, um, the Chinese regime, which I do not disagree with you, but you have not mentioned anything about the al allied regime or the Americans plus the allies. I'm Australian, so I'm part of that. Uh, and, the, um, and the pain and the suffering that was inflicted in the Middle East. Uh, by by the allies um, and living there I was first hand in refugee camps uh, you should see the conditions that people are living there you should see the pain and suffering that um, was inflicted on their but you, should, but you should stop with this because right now because I have seen it but he didn't ask me about that so I don't know about you but I've walked I've walked from Egypt I've walked across Gaza on the strip. I've walked across it from the Egyptian border to Israel proper across Gaza. And I've had Israeli uh, soldiers come on buses while I was in the, the West Bank and, uh, and pick fights with me about that kind of stuff. So please don't assume that you know what I've seen and what I haven't I, seen and tell me how limited I, it is I, because you don't know what I you're talking not. about. Okay, I was not assuming anything. There was a question coming, if you let me finish. Um, and the question was that the current currency that we have, the US dollar, it's not backed by anything, but, but you know, some people, and you mentioned Antonopoulos a few times, he claims that it's a, a, a war, a war bill backed money now, uh, whether it's Australian dollars, whether it's uh, US dollars, euros, the same. And uh, how what do we do to change that? Do you see anything ever being able to, to change that in order that the, 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 the pain and suffering is not inflicted by other countries onto other countries? Well, the pain and suffering is not inflicted by the US dollar. The US dollar is a very useful currency for the whole world to use as a reserve currency. It's why in a world with hundreds of currencies, and if you count cryptocurrencies, a world with uh, over 8,000 currencies, 62.5% of all international transactions that are recorded 
are done in dollars. There's nothing stopping people from using euros if they want to make a deal, buyer and seller both want to do it. But there is a there basically uh, is a risk reduction. Now, with the morons increasing the U.S. dollar supply by 41 percent since COVID and probably over 50 percent, the morons in charge of both the Trump administration and the Biden administration are going to destroy the dollar. So when you say, what can we do about it? Well, we, you and I and all the people on this call could come up with a plan to make it so that the dollar is not the reserve currency. But if you're smart, you will already have your plan for the dollar's collapse. So right now, for instance, I, I, I talked about packets. So I'll just use that as an example. And here's a quick survey. There are about 500 people in the chat buying and selling packet. I know of only two, I know of two who will accept US dollars. So if I want to buy packet, who will accept dollars? Everybody else says, I don't want those dollars. I want Ethereum or I want, they'll take Litecoin. There are people who request Dogecoin. Uh, they were, there are people who prefer Dogecoin to having US dollars. So the collapse of the US dollar has already <laughs> begun. And the more that they print dollars, the more that it's part of self-destruction. And this is the problem with evil. This is the great thing about villains. Villains end up being their own worst enemy and destroying themselves. So there are a couple of uh, uh, people that come to my mind when you're telling me uh, when you're saying that anybody can just stop using U.S. dollars as a reserve currency. Uh, Gaddafi and Hussein. So uh, their names come to my mind right away because they wanted to stop using U.S. Uh, currency as a reserve for selling their oil, and we all know what happened to them a few months later. So that's uh, that's my point when I say that. I know, the but the idea uh, that the idea that so first of all. Uh, um, I have worked for a U.S. senator and I have worked in the White House, but nobody's ever asked me, Alex, should we go and invade countries because they are not using the U.S. dollar? I mean, the Swiss don't use the U.S. dollar. They use the Swiss franc and we're not invading Switzerland. So there is, it is, there is more to it than if you don't use the U.S. dollar, then you can do this. Iran is trading oil to China and not using U.S. dollars. Cuba is not allowed to use dollars. You know, so there are lots of people who are not using U.S. dollars. I wrote a whole book this thick, 300 plus pages about how stupid we are to have an embargo against Cuba and have the vast majority of all the people working in OFAC telling them they can't use U.S. dollars because what Cuba is teaching the world, they go around doing seminars telling people how to not use the U.S. dollar. The U.S. is making so many mistakes. But when you talk about the the. Uh, you were going to say Gaddafi, and then you were going to say Saddam Hussein. Do you really think that the Israeli lobby has nothing to do with these things? I have no idea how to deal with the Israeli lobby and its, and its control over certain aspects of U.S. foreign policy. I can't do anything, and you can't do anything about it, but you're a lawyer, so what? and you're living in Switzerland, which is anywhere in Switzerland is a short drive from the United Nations in Geneva, why don't you come for a, with a plan that means that the U.S. isn't going to invade countries? But to lay that on me because I'm an American I was not, is I just was not laying down at all. There was a question. No, there was a question. It was a conversation. This is the not question, laying anything question, on you. I don't hold you. Then the question is very. The question has a very. Responsible. The very the the answer of the question: How do we keep the U.S. from invading other countries? Has a very simple answer, and everybody here watching this knows what the answer is. And that is stop using the US dollar and use cryptocurrency instead. Because as far as I know, there's nobody other than North Korea from stolen Bitcoin that is using uh, cryptocurrency to go and build its army and, and build its weapons. So to me, any that the US government has is spending too much money and it's spending too much money on the military. It's spending, if you count military and intelligence, it's spending more than a trillion a year. But I have to imagine that most of that money is stolen. And I imagine that most of it is fake for the simple reason that I have asked, been asking people for 20 years what our plan is to deal with China. And they never have a plan. So how can you be taking a trillion dollars a year and have no plan for China? 
I think most of it is fake. It's mostly just to get, it's a way for people to take money. And there, there, was a, there was a guy who stole money from the Pentagon. His name was Rabbi Dov Zakheim, Z-A-K-H-E-I-M. And Donald uh, Rumsfeld, who I, I know personally, you can find pictures of me with Rumsfeld on the internet. It used to be some big controversy about that. But I can just tell you that Rumsfeld announced that $2 trillion was missing from the Pentagon. Um, on 9-10. And then 9-11, um, there was the disasters, but conveniently, there were two groups looking at where that stolen money was. One of them was in Building 7, and Building 7 was destroyed. And the other one was, was the only group in the wing of the Pentagon that was otherwise unoccupied because it was under construction. So both groups were killed, and they were never rebuilt again. So this is the problem that I know. I know that if you point out that people steal trillions of dollars from the Pentagon and you really go looking after it, that you wind up dead. So that's not a problem that I have pro professionally, I have pursued because I don't really want to be killed. <laughs> I, I, think, I think none of us would want I, to I be miss killed. Crypto I, just to be clear, I miss Crypto Wednesdays so much. Like, I, 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 it's, like, killed, it's like so the let's gym. change it's, the subject. Let's change the subject from, from being killed and invading other countries. So um, we talked about Bitcoin being the internet na native money. So it's born on the internet and it stays on the internet. There's no human sort of, uh, uh, you know, checking, uh, checking the ledger anywhere. And we talked about DAOs that uh, it's kind of impossible right now at least to have a company born on the internet stay on the internet and remain on the internet although we see this is where it's all going i think we all agree with that you know combination of ai and uh, combination of self-driving vehicles and self-driving uh, and sort of smart cities self-managing itself do you if it was completely up to you right now and if you were to uh, envisage uh, a company that is born on the internet stays on the internet and, and lives on the internet, how would you go around it? If you had like a complete blank approval from whichever jurisdiction you pick uh, to stop on that? Well, you started by saying you can't do this, but I mentioned in the beginning, I don't know if you heard it. I mentioned that in Puerto Rico on Monday night, I met a guy who has launched a business on January 8th and generated over a billion dollars in revenue. I promise you that company was born on the internet it's entirely on the internet and it's genius. And if I told you what the business model is, you would your jaw would drop because it's so brilliant. Uh, so I just have to tell you that uh, these exist and they're relatively easy to do, uh, but you just have to find an anomaly. You have to find something that people think is temporary because if they think it's gonna be an ongoing market change, as opposed to a, a, a short-term thing, then the big companies will come in. But if big companies think it's only gonna last for a month or a quarter or four months, they won't necessarily spin up a website because it, it will take them too long to do it. So I guess the thing to, to say as a general principle, that's what you're asking, is to, uh, and, and Gordon said it earlier, he said, steal, don't invent. I mean, that's uh, when, when I went to MIT the very first day, and all my classes gave me these problem sets. And I went, holy shit, I mean, this is the first day? How am I going to do that? And I went to my fraternity brothers and I said, oh my God, how do I do this? And they said, well, this is the main reason to be in a fraternity. Here, oh, look. God. And on oh, the dude. shelf was the, <laughs> what, was the previous course and it was the problem sets worked on. Now they may have been the same problem set, in which case you could see how they did it, or it might be similar to it. But in other words, if you're in a fraternity, you have every course that you're likely to take, somebody's taken that course before and they can help you with it. Now, this is what's so great about crypto. This is why crypto is the greatest industry that's ever existed. The vast majority of all of it is software born on the internet, living on the internet forever and only on the internet. And it's open source, you can build on it. So the answer to this thing is to look at what someone else did and fork it. Just go and make your own version of it, but have your own community ready to go. So I have a few communities ready to go. I've had, I don't know, I don't know how many dozen people have told me you should create your own cryptocurrency. So I guess 
my answer to the question is be a great person. If people ask you for help, help them. If people ask you to be on their crypto Wednesdays, go on the crypto Wednesdays, be on it. Be a person who's there for other people and then create your own cryptocurrency because that's where the money is. And be in a low tax jurisdiction as a service like Puerto Rico or Switzerland. Thank you for this. Nice. Uh, or, or the Cayman Islands. Let's remember. <laughs> you go to the Cayman Islands, it creates kind of a stink. I think that there are certain jurisdictions that have a stink about them with reputationally. So I don't know. I would I would not go to places that are that are purely well, it's no good for Americans. any other redeeming features. Well, look, look, yeah, look, it's look, not good look, for look. Americans, but we are covid free. No masks. <laughs> no problems. I mean, and Marco, this is a little bit off course of the main thing, but my understanding is that the reputational issues associated with the Caymans are somewhat attenuated now based on the economic substance rules and their greater compliance with international norms. And it's a little bit outdated. Uh, yeah. Would you say that's true or am I being a little rosy? You no, know, that's, that's, that's awesomely true. The, 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 the stink on Cayman Islands is primarily Hollywood and almost exclusively American. Um, the, 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 your, the favorite thing you hear is like, oh, somebody set up an account for him in the Cayman Islands and then transferred all this money into it so they could blackmail him. And I'm like, it takes months to get a bank account in this country. Nobody who's got a brain banks in this country. They bank outside the country, but they live here. <laughs> Living here is wonderful. Same situation in, to a degree as, as Puerto Rico from a real estate perspective and from, you know, accessibility to things like Amazon and whatnot. But no problem with COVID. They are COVID free and have been for eight months now. Uh, so you, you have the, the benefits on that side, but you're, you're right. I mean, uh, every time I still see it today, I watch a TV show and I see someone say, Oh yeah, he's, he just transferred his money to the Caymans. I think that's usually two weeks worth of thing. You could stop it anytime you like, just call the bank and say, on oh, second thought, I don't want to transfer that money uh, because that's just the way things work. Uh, the, I think the stink uh, from the 80s and 90s is what caused this thing to happen. And by the time the Panama Papers came out, uh, Cayman was already well on its way to being more acceptable. And in fact, you, if you look in the uh, Panama Papers, Cayman was not one of the main places where people were hiding their money. <laughs> now, Panama was one of the main places people were hiding their money and, uh, and others. Uh, of course, Rica, Billy's, yeah. <laughs> Well, Isla Man, the the usual Malta, unfortunately. Oh yeah, Jersey Guernsey, uh, yeah. Um, interesting. The um, let's see here. Who do we got? Who do we got? Who a question. Got? Yeah, got a question. here. Go for it. So, CERN, the Large Hadron Particle Collider, um, is an extra jurisdictional entity. It is a sovereign entity. People have tried to sue it. And they thought that they could find a corporation to sue. They thought that they could go through Switzerland, but they couldn't. It was a sovereign entity or still is somehow. And I don't understand that process very well. Maybe, Alex, do you know anything about that and how to set up a non-jurisdictional sovereign nation, essentially, like a virtual nation? Uh, I have me. worked on setting up a sovereign nation before. You might have heard about something called New Utopia. And I actually put money towards that. Uh, I actually put up the money to own the Federal Reserve of New Utopia and the water and the sewage. I figured those would be the things to own. And right. I gave the keynote speech. We got the same architect to design New Utopia as designed the Atlantic Hotel, uh, Atlantis Hotel, okay. that's a centerpiece of the, uh, the Palms uh, in Dubai. Yeah, so great. same architect, beautiful designs. And ultimately... I don't think it's that hard to set up a new nation. It really comes uh, down to making a deal with the governments that are, that are nearby that could send their equivalent of the Marines or the Navy to stop you. But I think it's relatively easy. I don't know why so many people with money are talking on and on about seasteading. It's like, just stop talking about it and do it. It's like eunuchs yeah. talking about sex. You know, their balls are cut <laughs> off. And they're just talking on and on about sex. It's like, dude, just, you know, I don't know. Just stop talking about it and do it. So yeah. go, you can create the nation. And um, just can I, can I just repeat, I really missed this show. 
I just really missed it. And, you know, <laughs> it's just like, it's like, it's like, you know, deja, it's deja vu, yet it's happening. It's an interesting kind of mixed feeling. Alex, please I go on. There's some magic next. here, Gordon. So, but I just oh, want to say that when we always doing New Utopia, that all the negotiations were, it was, a, it was basically in an area of shallow water between Cuba and Honduras, closer to Honduras. And so it really came down to politicians in Honduras <clears> were asking for bribes. Now that led off, but, but they were uh, genuinely asking, well, what is the value to the region of Central America, the Caribbean of having new nations and new things? And I told them about an argument that's very similar to the one that Wolf and I were discussing a few minutes ago about decentralization. And others have talked about let a thousand governments bloom. You know, Mao said, let a hundred flowers bloom, try all these different things out. You know, anytime that- well, you, you know how that ended, come, right? Well, I've been talking about how it ended. Yeah. But it also worked. You think you don't think that China is letting a hundred flowers bloom? You know what a, a flower well, now. is? Alibaba is a flower. Yeah. Uh, Ant is a flower. Uh, Ten cent is a flower. Baidu is a flower. And they're very big flowers and their flowers worth trillions of dollars. Owned so, by the yeah, CCP, how mind you. End? Well, partly owned by the CCP. They don't own 100% of it. Smart well, governments don't entirely own it. In North Korea, they're run by morons, even though Koreans are geni- some of the highest IQ people in the world on average are Koreans. But because of communism, uh, which is a, a failed system from every different angle, they own 100% of all the businesses. In China, they realize that they don't have to own the whole business to have a uh, prosperity that was their big breakthrough insight it only took them like you know 40 years to figure it out and they basically copied the west but they kept their own characteristics of it but i just want to make this point about honduras in my con- conversations because of these conversations with honduras you now have a, an autonomous community on an island and honduras changed its laws so you know other people can have their story of it I would say to you that Honduras changed its laws because of, and even though Lazarus Long and his son didn't actually stay with the project, they didn't, they, they could have done it. I could have raised them the money to do it. It wasn't anyone stopping us and that mm-hmm. those discussions have borne fruit in the modern day by having what amounts to a nation within a nation in Honduras. And I think that fundamentally that DAOs Uh, um, and independent nations are the two of the toolbox to enable our world to survive uh, longer than we might. Because you have people like astronomer royal Martin Rees, and you have Stephen Hawking, who's now deceased, but who eight years ago to the day, two days ago, I actually sat in front of in his line of sight when he spoke at Caltech. So I have a feeling for him as a, you know, a living person. And uh, that these guys are saying, look, we might not survive as humanity on another hundred years. We might go extinct in a hundred years. And uh, we have life expectancy in the U.S. collapsing. Yeah, it's Each year for the last four years, average life expectancy in the U.S. has declined and it's accelerating. Last year, 2020, is the first year ever that life expectancy in the U.S. fell by a full year. So let's just say for sake of math that we have 350 million people in America That means 350 million human years of life were wiped off the map. And if you act, you know, say that the average person lives to 70 as an example, well, then that's uh, 175 million people being killed. That's the equivalent of that. I mean, what is that? No, 75. I don't know. Uh, uh, Let let me me pause you one second because we're actually coming up. We're fully coming up on the two hour mark. I would, okay, David led. I, I, I think we have a new guest here, but I, I think I know you somehow. So I, I just want to give you an opportunity to introduce. Yeah, somewhere, somehow. Hi, da- David Ledesma. Nice to meet Ledesma, all of you guys. Um, crypto and Bitcoin investor since July 2015. Uh, I'm the uh, founder of MBABullshit.com. So I have a YouTube huh. channel with um, 120,000 subscribers and maybe 16 million video views. You can check it out. Um, can I'm I be you? Because I follow one. <laughs> can I be Congratulations. you? Congratulations. That's amazing. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm here because uh, I'm, I'm an avid follower of the speeches of Alex. I met Alex briefly 
at, in Macau uh, maybe two years ago during the DeFi summit. And I was like, wow, this- I love was, that event. Yeah, that, that was a great event. And Alex was the absolute best speaker. So uh, I just follow his Facebook now and I'm, I'm eager to hear him when, when he speaks, I, I learned so much. So I saw that he posted this event. And so I'm oh. here, I, I'm in Bangkok, by the way. Hello from Bangkok. Hey, that's, that's great, Hello. man. Yeah. Happy to have you. Um, did you want to, thanks for coming on. Thanks for introducing yourself. I'm, I think you, I think you're a worthwhile Gordon, future Gordon, guest. You should say, you should say cup kun cup. Cup kun yeah. cup. Well, it's interesting. Sorry, I'm from the Philippines, actually, although I do live in Bangkok because here I'm an adjunct professor at, at university. But it's more of like a retirement. I'm sort of like semi-retired. Um, but uh, You're the youngest uh, looking retired person I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. Well, crypto and um, and my, my online business has, has allowed me that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so I don't have any specific question for Alex. I'm just listening. I might have, have a question later on. Yeah. Well, later on, you're actually the last comment of the show. So. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Yeah, I was, I was, I was teaching a class, an online class via Zoom, um, just a few minutes before I came on. But then, as soon as I got off and I saw Facebook, Alex posted on his Facebook some uh, Zoom thing. It's, oh, I want, I want to join that. So, so I joined David, it. why don't you, um, why don't you accept an invitation from Gordon and Sander to be a guest, and then I'll, I'll call in on your show. Sure, awesome. sure. Why not? Why not? Absolutely. Absolutely. David, can you can you type your full name into the chat just so I can add you somewhere? Yeah. David Ledesma. Well, on, on well, you can add me on. Yeah. Oh, OK. It's your set. OK. I'll send you my since it's a private. Yep. Yeah. It's perfect. Got Since it. Since that conference in Macau, isn't it amazing how much has happened in DeFi? Oh God! I mean, yeah. I, it's a what an explosion. What an explosion! I kid you not. Now I'm not. I'm not going to go into the debate whether we're earning from what we call shit coins and all these things, huh. but the yields in DeFi are just crazy. I'm in so many pools yeah. right now with thousands of percent, um, eight you know average uh, annual percent yield. But to play it safe, I'm 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 withdrawing daily and then converting it into more stable coins and into or into tokens for other pools and also I'm spreading the risk you know just in case one pool collapses or and it's just multiplying you know it's just multiplying my my holdings like crazy and it's just it's just ridiculous. Um, even when when I when I met Alex in, in Macau, it wasn't that it, it, you know 100% API was big at that time. Now it's like. You know, you have some pools which are like million percent. You're like, what the hell is that? And you just jump in for a short while and you jump out. You Fine. You say, oh, but that might be a Ponzi. Okay, fine. Instead of arguing whether it's a Ponzi or not, why don't we just talk about how to manage it, considering it could be a Ponzi. So just yeah. you know, jump you, in well, and jump you, out. Are you, are you aware? Are you, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to end the show. I'm going to give mm. you a prediction. All right, you ready for a futurist prediction? Absolutely. And I'm, as far as I know, I'm the first person to say this, that Bitcoin within this calendar year will hit a total return if you had bought it when it was first available of over a billion percent. Wow. And it'll be the first investment that the average yeah. person could have come in that will have a billion percent return. Wow, that's amazing. But in my Guys, case, guys I, I, actually, I, I'm sorry, so I, I'm, I'm going to stop you. Just because I got to, unfortunately, David. Thanks for. We're gonna have you on as a guest, Al Alex. You're, you're awesome. I love you. You're, you're the. You're love the, you, like Alex. The, he you're is like awesome. the. Alex you're is like awesome. the best guy to restart it. And re I feel like we rekindled one of my favorite people, here. Yeah. I think you just raised the bar again. All right, I love it. Um, and I, I, I well, thought, thank I, you. Yep. And by the way, whoever whoever's out there who's trying to get into the list, just add Gordon Einstein on Telegram. Okay, and then I'll introduce you to Sander. I'll put you in the Crypto Wednesdays group. Just Gordon Einstein. Just, and then I'll just I'll connect you with everyone. Okay, they just uh, just try to make life easy. Um, this is amazing. Just to, thank you, Art. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, alumni guests. Thanks, David, for making yourself known. Uh, Marco, you're awesome. Luke, you're awesome. Xavier, you know, Wolf and Abstentia, Arena, you know, I. I you're just a power keg. I love you. I love you. I love you. We got, you know, we got. So, may, but in closing, Gordon, yes. I invite you to come to, to Puerto Rico. 
I'm happy to host you. I have an extra bedroom and do a show from here and I'll introduce you to at least 10 fucking amazing people that you would love to meet that you don't know already. That oh, sounds fantastic. For women, but but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, also, he's retired, but I know, not dead. I know, I know, probably about thirty beautiful women here in Puerto Rico, so I can invite them to come as well. They love talking with crypto people. And when COVID's over, you guys can come come to Bangkok as well. <laughs> oh my God! You know, you know, yeah. given what, given my my twenty twenty like social de- debacle. Life is definitely looking up, so I, I bless you all, and I thank danger, you all. Danger, Gordon Einstein. Danger. Uh, uh, my, hey, it's <laughs> Gordon Danger Einstein. All right, Sonder, Sonder, <laughs> land this plane, my friend. Land it. I, I think, Gordon, that Marco was really right by saying this was, you know, we, we, we crossed the next level. Alex, wonderful guest. Thank you for spending quite some time, but also thank you for everybody that contributes because this was our goal, that we are meeting up with our friends, they're interacting with each other. We are sometimes, you know, giving each other a tough time, which is okay. We are all respect of with each other. I would like to uh, re-invite Alex in the next couple of weeks and maybe we can do a combo together with David. So David, really cool if you would join the, join the show also. So let's, let's schedule that. Um, but for the next week, before we say goodbye, I do want to emphasize because next week we've got some of right. our friends from Yellow, yellow.com. And this is Alexis. Most of you know Alexis from his, one of his previous companies, GSR, the big market maker for Ripple. So Alexis is one of our friends. He's going to be here and he's going to be joined by one of his partners, Jürgen Hubart, who's now in Hong Kong, originally from the European markets. The both of them have been working with myself already for a couple of years and I like to have them next week on the show so I would like we would like to invite you all next week to join as people you know from the community ask questions we're looking forward to next week's show but for this week Alex thank you very much for joining spending enough time and Gordon good to see you again thanks my friend everybody we look forward to seeing you again next week peace out folks Crypto is back thanks happy 2021 talk soon Bye. 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 Cheers.